So they, that's why all these players are here today. When this sort of, when a wildfire happens, the evacuation process goes on, there's a lot of different components that go on that we don't normally see day in and day out. All right? So that's why all these people have come here to uh, contribute their part uh, to educate us on what we need to do. All right? So some of the people that are going to be here are going to participate in the wildfire evacuation exercise on April 22nd. So I'm going to reiterate again, make sure you've signed in, you've got your little window placard, because we're going to make, we, when you all go, you're going to check in at Lexington School in the lower parking lot, and we need to keep track of who all the players are to make sure nobody got missed in the process. So it's going to be really important that you all, that you all sign up and make sure you keep track of everything that's going on. The, Mike, Jeff, and Chelsea over here, they're going to be the main presenters for today. Uh, we've got Jason, Lieutenant Jason over here from the Sheriff's Office. And Brian, you're the Lieutenant or the Captain on the engine? I'm a firefighter. Okay. Yeah. Right. So he's in charge. All right, he's in charge. That's just the way that rolls. Trust me, that's the way that rolls. And we've got Sergeant... Lee Atkins with the CFP. There we go. All right. So we've got all the players here. So this is also a really good time to uh, spend time talking with them, asking them questions as the day moves on. So I am going to turn this over to Italian Chief Jeff Cox and let him start his thing. So I appreciate everybody showing up. This is a standing room only event. Awesome. So thank you, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Hussain. My name is Jeff Cox. I'm Italian Chief for Santa Clara Unit, Cal Fire. Um, I just recently took over the position of 1613, which consists of the Stevens Creek Station and uh, the Alma Station, which is also part of the Helitap group, the helicopter, uh, just down the road here on um, Old Santa Cruz Highway. So I'm excited to be here, and uh, with that being said, I'll uh, start our presentation. So this is going to be our Ready, Set, Go exercise, or our, our PowerPoint to give you guys information on what you guys need when a wildfire hits. Did you know that 95% of all wildfires in California are little slide here. Are a little uh, fire safe while working or having fun outdoors? Use power equipment outdoors before 10 a.m. Technical difficulty. Yeah. It always happens. We got this. Okay. So what can you guys do? A little blurry there. Um, plant, prepare, and stay aware. So what to pack is going to be important also, or it's going to be important where to go, and that's what we're doing this for, right? Prepare yourself, your family, and have a go back. Nice. Thank you. Perfect. I thought I was going to have to get LASIK again. I was like, man, I'm done. It's hitting uh, stay aware, monitor active wildfires in the area. So, it first starts with you guys and how you guys are prepping your house and your home, right? Um, the defensible space part of things. And we're calling it hardening your home. Um, and touch on that stuff, when you guys are doing defensible space, there's two zones that are considered um, zone one, which is zero to 30 feet from your house, and then zone two, which is 30 feet from 100 to 100 feet. Um, what incorporates into your, zero, your zone one was removing all down dead grass, weeds, vegetation, um, remove branches that hang over your roof, and keep dead branches 10 feet from, uh, from your chimneys. Trim trees regularly to keep branches a minimum of 10 feet from other trees. Uh, relocate your wood piles into the zone 2 area. Remove and prune flammable plants and shrubs in your windows. And remove vegetation and items that could catch fire and around your decks, balconies, and or stairs. And then create a separation between trees, shrubs, and items that could catch fire such as patio furniture, wood piles, swing sets, etc. We'll move into zone two, keep mow, keep or mow annual grasses down a minimum height of four inches. Create horizontal space between grass, shrubs, and trees. Create vertical space between grass, shrubs, and trees. Um, what we're talking about there is they don't want to be touching, right? Um, if, if 
they're touching, that's going to be a continuous fuel bed for the fire to carry. And with it being close to your house, then that just gives the possibility of embers to fly into either a receptive fuel bed, on your roof, um, anywhere where a fire could possibly start. And a vertical is limb up your trees from 0 to 10 feet. Um, and that also gives it a fuel receptive um, sport to climb up the tree and send spots in case um, the winds pick up or anything like that. A more receptive fuel bed. Remove all fallen leaves, needles, twigs, barks, cones, and small branches. Um, and then all exposed wood piles, again, must have a minimum of 10 feet clearance around them. So, are you set? Three steps of getting set. Uh, create a wildfire action plan, which we're going over right now. Uh, assemble an emergency supply kit. We'll talk about these more in depth. And fill out a family uh, communication plan. So, creating the wildfire action plan, a checklist. Create an evacuation plan. Be prepared. Remember the six P's. People's and, people and pets. Uh, papers, phone numbers, and important documents, descriptions, uh, vitamins and eyeglasses, pictures and irreplaceable memorabilia, personal computers, hard drives, discs, plastics, uh, meaning your credit cards and your cash. Send a, uh, assemble an emergency supply kit. Face mask coverings, three-day supply of non-perishable foods, and three gallons of water per person. Um, prescription or special medications, extra glassware, hybrid glasses, contacts, an extra set of keys, credit cards, cash, first aid kits, flashlights, uh, sanitation supplies, copy of important documents again, and then uh, chargers for your cell phones. The family communication plan. Uh, where to go when you guys evacuate. So just be in contact with uh, family members that, that you can go to out of the area. An area, emergency contact, other important phone numbers, and then two pre-designated evacuation routes. And these are just sites if you go to our uh, readyforwildfire.org. Um, you can look at all these little checklists that you can, you can fill out and, and be prepared for. And then you can sign up for emergencies, um, for the text emergencies at the Incident Wildfire, Incident Ready for Wildfire.org. Um, like it says, you just put your zip code in there, and if there is an incident, I'm not sure exactly the range, if you can put a range on it, um, and it'll send you an alert if there's a wildfire in your area. If you guys want to write that down, it's pretty, pretty good little. So this is going to be, I think, the most important thing, and I, myself and CHP and County Fire and uh, Sheriff's Office are probably going to hit this hard, is go early. Um, when, when you guys get the notification, uh, don't wait. I know for when you get, we get the dispatch and in route here, it's probably within, I don't know, 10 minutes, depending on where, where the resources are at. Um, so when you guys get the notification, especially in this area, having the, the road systems being so tight, it's going to get clogged up and um, our access is going to be hampered, to say the least, um, for getting to these fires. So if you guys can go early, that would be the most important thing and, and have all this stuff packed up for when we get here, we can, we can do our jobs. Okay. When you say go early, when we had the CTU fires, we were often in the, well, my animals were in the yellow zone. If you wait for the red zone, is, is that the 10 minutes? When we just, no. that's if you go yellow to red in 10 minutes? Or? No, we can no. We'll go over that in our next section. Oh, for the okay. Same okay. Day, but okay. The, the different colors are, there's no, there's no set time frame. If it's yellow, if it could go red in 10 minutes, it can go red in five days. When you get, you know, if it's yellow or advisory level, it's especially around here with the way that we are, we're losing our primary and secondary routes out of here, the sooner the better. Yeah. So yeah. just yeah. 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 Just These roads were never meant for everybody to be on the road at the same time. No. They were never meant that way. Yeah. We barely have two.
So what to take during evacuation? So we have the uh, review the evacuation plan checklist. Ensure your emergency supply kit is in your vehicle. Uh, cover up to protect against heat and flying embers. Locate your pets and take them with you. Uh, what to do if you become trapped near a wildfire in your vehicle? Uh, park, park your vehicle in an area, clear vegetation, uh, close all the windows and vents, cover yourself with a wool blanket or a jacket, uh, lie on the vehicle floor. While on foot, use your cell phones, dial 911, keep the air, keep or go to an area clear of vegetation, lie face down, cover your body, and then if you're out walking, don't walk in the middle of the road. Um, Sounds sounds it sounds easy to say that, but people people do that. And um, with emergency vehicles coming in and it being smoky, um, you don't want to get hit. So be on one side of the road, one or the other side of the road. Uh, at home, call nine one one. Keep household members together. Fill sinks and tubs with cold water. Keep doors and windows closed but unlocked. Stay inside your homes and stay away from outside walls or windows. You know, that's, that's referring back to if you know it's a windy day, then you know that fire is going to go that much faster, right? Um, and depending on where it's at in this area with the terrain, it's going to move twice as fast. So that's why we want to hit on evacuating fast. Go fast. Because um, with all those components, it, yeah, it, it's a fast moving fire. And depending on the time of day, time of year, it all, it all depends. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but yes. Yeah, doing your defensible space, it, that, that's your best, best avenue to saving your house, realistically. In the past, um, I think it was you guys who come around and look at each property. Yeah, we do our defensible space inspections. I haven't gotten one of those in property. So we've, we've gotten some new inspectors, and we're going to start doing that. Um, there's been a... Um, controversy on when to do it because we don't want to go out and tell you guys to do it um, in December because then it's just going to grow back, right? right? So, and then we don't want you guys to do it in the summertime because you're kind of too late already. Yeah, you can do it, but then there's a time frame you want to do it before 10 a.m. You know, you're out with a, a weed whacker and you start a fire and we told you to do it though, right? Uh -huh. So... <laughs> We also have our ability if you guys would like one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, Chelsea Young is our wildfire specialist, and if you call the fire marshal's office line and ask for a inspection, we would be happy to come out and, and walk her through as well. So that, that counts. Yeah, like Chief Matheson said, if you guys, if you need um, a documentation saying you have this all cleared, we can come out and do an inspection because I know a lot of insurance are requiring that now, especially because of all the fires. The same with selling your house. Yeah, selling your house. Last year they, I think last year they implemented it. What do you need lights on if you're traveling? Lights and hazards on, yeah, if you're traveling. Um, and just obviously don't drive towards the fire, drive away from it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and it, that's if it sends a spot somewhere. Say you're, you're a little further out and we get a spot fire and it starts going up. So now you're stuck between the two, right? Where do you go? Well, best place is probably get on the ridge line. You don't want to be in a chimney shop or a chimney or a draw, um, and you get or in an open area. Obviously, the the timber is going to burn a lot hotter than grass, right? So your your survivability is better in the grass than in timber. Sort of open area. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to jump in here real quick on that too. Yeah. So part of what the Chemical Firewise Group has done here is we've tried to create an uh, area of refuge, a temporary area of refuge right here in the park. Mm -hmm. So if you get jammed up and you can't get out, this is the place to go. Mm -hmm. But this is not your primary place to go. Your best thing, I'm sorry to step on you here. No, you're good. No, the best thing to do is get out of here as soon as you can. All right? And that's going to be everybody's comfort level. When the CZU fire was going on, David and I stayed long. But that was because I was willing to stay long. But I have a different perspective than she does on that sort of thing. <laughs> so um, if you, so the, the goal is get out of here sooner than later, right? Whatever your comfort level is. If you're nervous and you want to get out, get out, all right? And don't, you know, just do that. But if you get jammed up because if something happens here really quickly, this is the place to go. 
Leave your cars out back, out here. Don't park them in, in this area. Keep that area as much as open as you can for humans. Right? To where if we, and especially here, um, we, we have limited access to water, right? We have our 500, 500 gallons in each engine. And if we can get a water tender, I'm, I'm sure a water tender would be coming. Um, but when we see a tank that's got 2,500 gallons and it's got our connection on it, we make mental note of that. Like, okay, that's a good water source. That's where we can go to to get more water. Um, yeah, if you guys are running your sprinklers and wetting it down, that's not, it's not going to do anything because depending on when the fire gets there, it's just going to evaporate and be done. So, so when you guys hook up to the um, fire hydrants here in the park, mm -hmm. is that using our drinking water? Is that it the is. source? Yeah. Oh, okay. It is. Yeah. <laughs> is there additional? Is there any additional? I mean, like we make requests to make or? to in areas like this, we have an additional uh, water tenders that we can go to. We can pull from Santa Clara County. Um, we have this called a hired equipment list to where we get um, other agencies and um, private vendors in. And once we make that request, then we just give them a designated spot to come to, and that's where the stage for our water source. I see. Okay, so the last question is, you know, some people here in the park have pools. Mm -hmm. Is that considered? Yeah, a I've drafted out pools pool? before. Okay. You know, we, have, uh, we have Honda pumps on our engines, okay. and it, if, so if we could good? utilize that, we, we will. I um, say, would that be a good information for you? For you guys to know ahead of time, we would, five depending five. on how much time we have, right. we'll come in and we'll look at an area and we'll do an our we'll do our assessment. You know, access egress. What do we have? Where the propane tanks are at? Where the power lines at? Where's the propane? Or where? Yeah, I think I already said that propane tanks. Um, and then what water sources do we have? Okay, they have a pool right on. I'm going to make a mental note of that one. Okay, they have a, a 10,000 gallon water tank with a good connection. Okay, cool. I'm going to really make a note of that. one. Um, so we're doing our assessment when we come in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, which streets are the most hazardous to have on your property? Would they be like bay trees? Are they, are they very flammable? Bay trees are flammable. They are. The oiler, the tree, the more flammable, right? Um, the big thing is, is getting the clearance around it. So if you have a shrub right underneath it, and then you have grass growing right next to the shrub, that grass is going to catch, right? and it's gonna catch that shrub, and you have low, low hanging limbs into that tree, that tree's gonna catch. And then all we need is wind, and then this tree's connected to this tree, and then there it goes. It's gone. You gotta get on that soon. Yeah. And we'll, depending on how much time that we have when we come in to do a wooey, um, wildlife or urban interface, uh, if we have, if we're designated to go to a community, we'll, we'll try to do as much as we can to prep that house. But that all depends on time. So with, with depending on where the fire is at, the predicted that it's going to be here in two hours, then we'll disperse uh, resources to these houses and we'll do a quick assessment. Okay, we can, we can get rid of this real quick, throw this over here. That's why um, if you've ever been in a fire or your house has been evacuated and there's been crews that came in, and you're like, yeah, I didn't remember putting that there. Well, that was probably us or, or local government or, or whoever's doing construction protection clearing your house for as much as we can to, to help it. Zoning, you're going to be notified through an SCC or a WIA, which we'll get into later in the uh, presentation. But Zone Haven is an important um, tool that we use now to be able to rapidly and efficiently evacuate large groups of people quickly. Before, and uh, you know, Chelsea will go into it, you'll see some pictures, we used to have to write really technical uh, we draw out the zones of the areas in which we wanted to evacuate. And so if we were to say anybody living west of Highway 17, east of Summit Road, south of um, Bear Creek, and uh, west of Soda Springs, would you know that that would be your community? Maybe. But if you were to say, hey, zone SCC 003, 004, 005, go. If you know you lived in those zones, you'd know it's time to go. And that's what this program is designed to do. Get you guys notified and moving in a, in a relatively quickly and efficiently. So with that, I will pass it on to Chelsea to uh, go over our program. Do you mind? Oh, that's right. Awesome. Uh, good morning, everybody. 
As Chief Matheson mentions too, I know a lot of people have questions about kind of the home ignition zone stuff. Um, at the end of the presentation, I can get you the phone number for the fire marshal, so you can call them and request uh, inspection by me, and these guys also do uh, inspections as well. Since you're in the SRA, as Chief Matheson mentioned, you'll get, uh, it, it'll be to the state standards as opposed to the local standards. So Santa Clara County Fire, we cover uh, seven cities within West Santa Clara as well as these uh, unincorporated areas, and that's where you guys fall. And so Zone Haven is, uh, as Chief Madison said, kind of a more condensed way to get everyone ready for evacuation. We'll go over how to sign up for it if you don't know your zone already to find your zone, and then the different alerts that we put out that kind of go in concert with that. So we're gonna kind of go over what is Zone Haven, uh, how it's used, and the importance of receiving the alerts. Zone Haven itself is not an uh, alert mechanism, so it's kind of, it works in, in addition to alert SCC or the, uh, what is it, the, yeah, wireless the, WIA, emergency. the wireless emergency alerts, and we'll talk about kind of the difference between those two and the pros and cons and why you want to be signed up for both. Um, we'll touch on emergency preparedness, a little bit of the Ready, Set, Go stuff that Chief Cox went over, um, and then we'll touch a little bit on evacuation, because I think most of you are here because you're going to be participating in this exercise that we're doing, so we'll touch on that a little bit as well. Awesome. So Zone Haven is a tool for uh, us, you know, fire and other uh, emergency response agencies to communicate clearly and effectively to you all. And it's not used just for fire. We do use it for evacuations for fire, but it's also used for um, other emergencies as well. So prior to this, as Chief Matheson was saying, people would have to go in and hand draw and figure out like what areas are going to evacuate. And you know, if you don't know your cardinal directions, it gets confusing. You don't know where to go. This is kind of an easy way that um, allows you to look up the status of your community and figure out what you need to do in a way that you know you don't have to do a bunch of Googling to figure out like, oh, am I in this zone or am I not? If you know your zone, you can easily type in your number and see what the status is if you need to evacuate or not. So these are some examples of um, the effective uses of Zone Haven. It's something that's kind of been around for a little while and the use of it in like several counties in California and I believe nationwide. Is it just California? Okay, so maybe it's just California at this point. Um, a lot of communities have been adopting this and finding success with it. So it was used for the CZD Lightning Complex in 2020, for the Glass Fire, the Red Salmon Complex Fire, as well as some incidences in 2021 also. So this is something like, it's, it's not brand new, it's kind of, it's been used in the field and so it's a pretty streamlined thing. It's been battle tested. Battle tested, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so kind of here's what the platform looks like. It's available um, on uh, mobile devices as well as websites and stuff. Zone Haven Evac is the first responder side of things. So that's like kind of the back end where um, the sort of the, the people that are in the room making the plans and stuff have the ability to figure out which zones need to be evacuated or maybe what needs to be um, a warning versus an order. And so they'll change that. And then Zone Haven Aware is what you all will have access to, and that's the part that you see where you can look up the different zones. And uh, it's definitely helpful to know the zone for where you live and also where you work, or if you have any you know, relatives that you're concerned about also, kind of just keeping a list of the different zones that are important to you for different reasons. And you can just go to the website, you can plug it in on your smartphone, and uh, find out the information for those. We have a QR code coming up, so those with phones, if you guys want to. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have a little exercise for those of you that aren't signed up already. We'll get you signed up and go on your zone right now. Uh, we, we do, we have adjusted a, a, some of them up here. I wouldn't say we're going to adjust them as much, but they do, they do tend to get adjusted. So it is good to go in every once in a while just to type in your address, make sure you're still in the zone that you thought you were in. Most of our zones are, um, are, are partitioned out based on law enforcement jurisdiction. So, um, you know, we're not gonna have a zone, for instance, that's gonna be part Campbell PD and part Sheriff's Office, right? We're gonna have zones that are, yep, Campbell PD's responsible for that, Sheriff's are responsible for this, so, because, like I said, our law enforcement partners are the ones that are gonna be shepherding these evacuations. What is it, zone, as long as we're in the subject? We'll get there in just a moment. Yep. Um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of like the funding and where we are in the stage of implementing Zone Haven, and then in a couple of slides, 
We'll have a QR code you can sign, and it'll show you how to figure out what zone you're in. And we'll go over what a zone is. And we'll, yeah. Um, so Santa Clara County Fire Department put forward the funding to kind of get this going in the cities that we cover, as well as the unincorporated areas of Santa Clara County. Um, a lot of the personnel wrote grants to really get the funding to get this out there because we knew that this was going to be a really effective tool uh, for everybody. And we're currently in the process of getting it live countywide as well. So for now, this is just within the county fire jurisdiction, but um, hopefully before the end of this year, we'll have it throughout all of Santa Clara County will be sectioned into these zones. Yeah, and that's, that's been a point of confusion uh, for the last years. You know, why is only the, the west side of the, of the county covered and the rest of it is not? And so, <clears throat> county fire, you know, a lot of us are, uh, work on incident command teams statewide. And we were on a lot of the incidences that we had listed earlier that utilized the zone haven. And we saw the benefit of being able to rapidly evacuate uh, large amounts of people efficiently and brought that back to our management team to say, hey, this might be something we want to invest in. Uh, for our jurisdiction and maybe even for our whole county. So our uh, administration had, uh, decided to invest the money to initially build zones for ourselves and then on the back side we wrote a grant, uh, a shish gap grant for the rest of the county so that the rest of the county could pay for this service as well. Um, it takes time as you guys are all going to figure out, uh, especially if you're going for FEMA grants to do storm recovery uh, for some of your roads or your properties up here. It takes time to encumber those funds and get, the, get that money in the pot that you need it to be put into. So there's been a delay countywide. We are live and we have been live since last year. The goal this year is to get the rest of the county live by fire season. That is all 100% dependent on all the other jurisdictions. Gilroy, Morgan Hill, Los, uh, Milpitas, San Jose, they've got to make sure that they're going to they're going to ground truth their zones before they go live to make sure that, that, that it works for their law enforcement agencies. Um, the zone, I will tell you that the zones are already drawn and they could go live like that if we needed to. Um, and they can be utilized. It's just, if you don't know you have the tool, you don't know what zone you're in. Just, so, you all have zones and uh, Hopefully by the end of, uh, by May-ish or June, the whole county will have the zone as well. Santa Cruz okay. County uses zone haven as well. Okay, so that in yeah. terms of that coordination. That's correct. Yep. And so when, uh, just a, a side note about um, the CZ Lightning Complex fire. We pressed zone haven into, uh, into use a little earlier than we were ready to do so. Because when that fire looked like it might have jumped Highway 35, we put a lot of Los Altos Hills on an advisory and nobody knew what the heck they, what we were talking about, right? And so that is an example of how we could turn on zones if we needed to right now. It's just the people don't know what it means, right? So that's, uh, that's going to be, that's why we're out here. We're trying to educate a lot, as many people as we can, and that's going to fall on the other agencies and cities, um, their citizens as well. About it. How many of you are familiar with Zone Haven already? How many of you know what zone you're in? Awesome. Okay. So this is great. A lot of you are going to find out today. <laughs> Um, and so when should you check Zone Haven? As I mentioned earlier, it's not just for fires. This is kind of broad use for any sort of emergency situation, wildfires, earthquakes, severe weather. Don't know anything about that. <laughs> it sort of hazardous materials, active shooters, uh, flooding, anything like that is a, if you're kind of like, if something feels off and not quite safe to you, check Zone Haven and see if there's any guidance on what you should be doing. And in a little bit here, we'll go over kind of the different colors that the zones do and kind of what that means. Yeah, we did a shelter in place for the snow using zone here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so zone haven kind of helps when events are complex. As we were saying, just like Chief Matheson said, you can change things really quickly. It's kind of like this communication that's just really clear. It can help different agencies coordinate, kind of like we were talking about between the different counties and with uh, law enforcement and Cal Fire and Santa Clara County Fire Department. If all of the responders are kind of trained on this tool, then it's kind of, it crosses those boundaries so everyone is using the same zones, the same language and everything to describe like the, um, the different statuses of the zones. And um, 
It does require uh, coordination of traffic congestion during evacuations too, because if it's this very clear, if everyone's getting these notifications at the same time and trying to go, we need to make sure like on our side of things to help keep things kind of organized and safe, and that's part of what we're going to be doing in the evacuation drill, is kind of seeing how that feels when you have a lot of cars on the road and a lot of you on the road, um, and like where all of our different agencies will be able to kind of help facilitate this uh, safe and hopefully orderly uh, exit. Okay, so the standard terminology, um, kind of a standard green, yellow, red system, and then a couple of colors down below. Green is normal, everything's good. Um, and then the advisory versus evacuation warning, that's kind of like what we were talking about earlier when Chief Cox was saying to go early. If you notice something is in uh, an advisory zone, that's a good time to start thinking about, okay, like remembering the steps of ready, set, go. Like, do you have everything prepared? Do you have a go bag ready? Do you know where that is? Do you have all your medications together? And when it gets into the warning section, as Chief Matheson said, it could change in five minutes from a warning to an order, or it could stay at a warning for a long time. So it's best to get out early. Don't wait until it gets to an evacuation order to go. Especially out here, like we've kind of been hammering in, these roads are nuts. It's going to be chaos if everyone's trying to go at the last minute. Also, with this neighborhood, um, especially in the event of a fire, it's not a good place to shelter in place. You don't want to be here in your home when a wild fire comes through, no matter how good of a job you've done with your uh, home, ignition, home ignition zone clearing. Uh, so getting out early, kind of, yeah, definitely, and continue checking in. Like this is something like once you check, don't be like, okay, it's advisory, like, cool, I'll, you know, check it later in the day to see. This is something that you want to be like really keeping tabs on so you can know when changes occur. Um, and we'll go over what the definitions are on the next slide between warning and order. But for you guys, if you're looking at a map, if your area is in yellow and you see red really close by, chances are that red is in the footprint of the fire, or it's within the box in which we're trying to box that fire in, right? We, wildfires are put out by surrounding it. If you're in a red, chances are your, your community is within that box that we're going to try to keep that fire from uh, to contained to. If it's in yellow, it's just outside that containment line of that box. And if it jumps that containment line, it can go red like right now. Right? Okay. And then shelter in place, as Chief Matheson said, that was kind of tested out during the snow and stuff. Um, it's purple, so it's kind of outside of those other um, colors because it's a little, it's a different thing. It's not telling you to evacuate. It's just hang out and wait for the storm to pass. Uh, okay, so yeah, here's a little bit like the evacuation warning is the potential threat to life and property. And then the order is an immediate threat, like Chief Matheson just explained, kind of. So looking at not just your zone, but the areas around you and what colors those are, that'll give you a bigger piece of the story, too. You don't just want to focus on your specific zone and be like, oh, we're yellow. Okay, who don't have to go. If you notice that one, two zones over, it's red, chances are things could shift pretty quickly, like we were talking about with wind earlier, too, or like flammable trees on your property and stuff like that. Uh, if, if the fire is nearby, just because your zone isn't yet in that evacuation order, that's something that could easily come up really quick. So again, get out early, make sure you have all your things together, and start making that plan to get out before it gets to the red zone. And then for evacuations too, you know, like perhaps the law enforcement guys can touch on your, your rights. You don't have to leave. You can stay. But just know that if you stay, you're going to hamper our efforts to contain that fire because life comes before property and environment. And if you choose to stay after we've asked you to leave, you've now just complicated our mission. And if if they if they choose to leave, you can't come back, right? Is that correct? Is that how that works? But he's not going to drag you out of your house. You guys have a right to make your own decisions. But just know that I cannot, and I don't think Chief Cox is going to guarantee that I'm going to be there to, to bail you out if your house is consuming, you know, we're, we're assuming you're gone already, so, 
That's just a no BS way of saying that. You're on your own if you say. Less vehicles on the road, the better. If you can fit it all into a vehicle, I would fit it all into one vehicle. That way you know you're together. You're not separated. You're not going to get cut off. And right, think, place for us to park. Yeah, and kind of like Chief Matheson was getting up to, like a car sitting in the driveway versus another car on the road as fire engines are trying to get into the community in a place like this, like that's going to cause uh, a lot of difficulties to navigate on these really narrow roads. Um, so, yeah, personal decision, but yeah, less cars on the road, the better, especially when it gets like down to that crunch time. Okay. All right. So, All right. Yep. Did you want to go? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, here's a QR code. If you're not familiar with QR codes, you should be able to point your phone camera at the screen, and this will take you to the uh, community.zonehaven.com. You can also just type that into your browser, and so we're going to um, get you figured out what zones you're in. So as Chief Matheson was saying, the zones are based on uh, law, enfo law enforcement boundaries, uh, and so they're kind of there's. A lot of stuff that I don't fully understand that goes into making these zones the funky shapes that they are, which you'll see in a minute. Um, and so after, after you get to community.zonehaven.com on the next page, we have a list of steps for how you uh, input your information to get your zone. So we'll give you guys a couple minutes to see if you can navigate it. Because uh, we'll we have a five minute video, step by step, how to access uh, where you live. And if anyone wants help trying to find it, are our folks doing our folks getting to community lab Zonehaven? Yeah. Finding it? Yeah. Okay, good. Is anyone having trouble getting there? Alright. Okay. Here we go. Alright. So here's the steps. Are people kind of figuring it out how to do it, or do you want me to walk you through like the different steps for figuring out where you are? Okay, so yeah, it's 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 supposed to be pretty user friendly. Uh, you type in your address. Seasons, and uh, you almost have to constantly be aware of your surroundings and, and how you're where you're going to go if you need to get out quickly. Unfortunately. Um, so again, Stonehaven is not a notification platform. Alert SCC is your notification platform. We good? All right. <laughs> And this is just going a little bit over. It's free. Multiple languages. But like Jake Matheson was saying, there's short messages in there. There should be a link you can click to that will have a little bit of the expanded version, as well as uh, other languages. If you need, yeah, if you can't quite understand that. I think it's, it usually goes out in English and Spanish. Yeah, I think there's, Viet, there's uh, five or six different yeah, languages. Vietnamese now, Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, the Tiger log. Yeah. And then social media. Oh yeah, um, these are so different social media accounts that are pertinent throughout uh, Santa Clara County. You can follow uh, Twitter. Oftentimes, we'll put out alerts on Twitter too because it's just it's an easy way to quickly get a message out to a lot of people, uh, as well as pretty much all social media platforms. Uh, we're all on it these days, yeah, especially social. my generation. Yeah. <laughs> incredible social media platforms too. Okay, so next door is not. Yeah. Necessarily incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make sure you're following the actual, like the fire department, uh, PD, and like the Zone Haven specific one. Uh, yeah, the, the actual organizational ones, they should have like what, the blue check mark or something, the verified. Yeah, we, I, I can guarantee, and I'm sure Cal Fire is the same way, if we're making some sort of protective action, we're tweeting about it, and you guys have a very robust mm -hmm. tweeter. <laughs> so if it's a if it's a credible source, you're going to get the same credible information. I would just really be caught, and I know how the information flow can sometimes be frustratingly slow for those of you that really need to know information now because we've all been trained that I need it now, as opposed to being like realistic with how busy the rest of us are trying to do to try to mitigate what we're going on. Um, but just know that we are trying our best to get that information out to you and. Try not to get down that rabbit hole of the bloggers who are from Nevada that are now second guessing and armchair quarterbacking the decisions that Jeff and I are making out here. Um, social media can be good, but can also it can also lead to uh, people making decisions that are not necessarily in the best interest. So, 
grain of salt. During the weekdays, they're really good, but that's the thing. It's most, you know, something happens on the weekend. I don't have my Twitter person not up on on the weekends, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of times these fires start when people are recreating. And, well, like I said, for me, yeah, that that's going to be up to uh, us, essentially, as the IC, as when we go unified command. We're going to be setting those evacuation warnings and orders, and we're going to be talking with sheriff, we're going to be talking with CHP, and and like Chief Matheson said, it could change in an instance to where. Okay, we're looking at a map, or right, let's put an evacuation warning in this area. And this is where the direction's going with the incoming winds and weather. This is where we think it's gonna go, so let's get these people out right now. And that's where we're gonna start doing orders and warnings. And then we'll set it out, okay, if it's within an, uh, a mile radius of the fire, we might do two miles at the head of the fire, which is the front of the fire. Um, so we might go a little further just because pre-planned for, okay, if it's gonna reach this area, they're already out. And then do a warning after that. Right, it all depends on the activity. Yeah, it really yeah, it all depends on the activity and where we see this going. Where's our box? Yeah, where's our box? Fire's so, dynamic and so is the decision yeah. making on what goes where. Fire's gonna go path of least resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Right wherever water goes and wind goes. So if we get a fire against Soda Springs, Lexington Fire of 1985 started right at Soda Springs. North, you guys get a north wind every day here unless you have a low pressure system coming through and then it's a south wind. Because you guys are in the confluence of two creek drainages, Moody and Los Gatos. So winds come and they come north and they would put, so fire starting down near the dam face is going to run towards your community. And so Jeff and I get there, okay we're going to try to keep the fire north of this, south of this, east of that, and west of this. That's our box. Doesn't mean we're gonna let the fire burn there. That's, that's another misconception that people think is like, oh my God, my house is within your containment line. You're gonna let my house burn down. That's not the case. We're gonna to continue to try to fight the fire and keep it within the smallest footprint we can find. But if we can't get there, or we can't do it because of the weather conditions, then our box is this. This is our containment box. It may get there in three days, it may get there in three hours. But if you're within that box, you're gonna get an order. And then we go secondary line. If we can't keep it within that box, then we have a secondary box, which is larger. Sometimes it could be five, 10 miles out. You're gonna get a warning, just in case we can't hold that box. Okay, and that's where it can change. It can change depending on... So fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah, and we're looking at the progression of the fire too. We have uh, analysis is that, okay, and in this exact weather, where, how far is this gonna go? And they can predict, okay, well, it's gonna go three ridges over. Okay, well, we better put our, our order in on that and then our warning past that. Okay, copy. Because we're trying to also move resources into that, yeah. those areas to get out ahead of it. And if you're there and you're not gone, that's problematic, right? Because you don't carry water with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Constantly reassessing the activity of the fire and trying to give you guys that information also. And, and let you guys be, and that's where it's important where you guys are prepared because like we both talked about, it can be just like that where, okay, we had this, um, this weather system come in unexpected, usually usually not, but now we need to set the, the warning here. Or we had a wind shift, okay, now we need to set it order here and warning here. Okay, when we have an evacuation order in place. Can I pause so much time? <laughs> Yeah. We, we don't have a ton of time. If you want to talk like afterwards, we can definitely mingle. And we also have um, Santa Clara County Fire uh, Community Outreach and Education. We're going to have a lot of webinars on evacuation stuff as well as home emission zone planning. Um, I want to get through my last couple slides and then uh, let the Sheriff's Office talk a little bit, but we definitely were happy to we'll stick around and chat more too. We'll uh, yeah, so this is kind of the emergency preparedness stuff that uh, Chief Cox went over. Uh, there's a lot more information about this on the Cal Fire website as well as on our website. And the video that we just saw is also on the Santa Clara County Fire Department website uh, as well. And then, oh, I guess that was it. Okay. Oh. I thought there was a couple more. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'm Jason Brown, I'm a lieutenant with the Sheriff's Office. Currently signed to uh, as the Assistant Division Commander for the West Valley Office, which we provide services to your area, right? Um, I don't have any fancy slides. I'm going to make you look at me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <all right. laughs> don't tell my wife that. <laughs> um, let me just start by saying this. I, I know nothing about fires. 
right? I missed firefighting day in the police academy. I must have been sick or something, right? I, I don't know. But I do know this. I trust these guys, all right? When I'm hurt or I'm injured, the first people that come to help me are, are them. When something's burning, the first thing that happens is they come and they help me. So as the law enforcement person, when we're working together at a command post and they tell me, hey, we think we need to put an evacuation warning in these areas, guess what I do? I say, hey, good idea. <laughs> when they say we need the evacuation order for these folks, I give them a double thumbs up and then that's when I go and take action, right? But I trust them. And so, you know, when they tell me that this area needs X, Y, and Z, I, I believe it, right? Um, and I believe that they're going to have everybody prepared for whatever that order is for that particular location. Um, you know, as someone who grew up in the Sierra foothills, right, um, I dealt with you know, fires every year, just like you guys do, right? Every summer and late summer, the air quality was poor, you know. I couldn't go play baseball games because, you know, God knows if I was going to be able to, to breathe while I was playing, right? So I, I've been in these shoes, right? Now, granted, now I live in the concrete jungle. But guess what? I know my zone. I know what zone our substation is in, right? Because it's important. Uh, I cannot stress enough for everybody to sign up for Alert SCC, you know, whatever notification systems have um, ours and, and, you know, County Fire and Cal Fire's uh, social media um, pages available because we are going to find every way possible to try and let everybody know in whatever affected zone kind of what's going on, right? Whether it's a warning or an order. I mean, they talked about the difference between warnings and orders. So what does the sheriff's office do, right? So we're going to be working with them no matter what, right? Whether there's orders, warnings, we want to be present so that we can have this unified um, command and know right away when we need to take some action. So when a warning comes out in a certain area, the sheriff's office is already going to kind of be in that area. We're not going to be going door to door and telling people, hey, you guys are under an evacuation warning, right? But we do encourage people by taking that seriously and being prepared because an order could be imminent, right? You know, we believe in the philosophies of better sooner than later, right? Those that need uh, longer to evacuate, those with large animals, they may need to start preparing and maybe, you know, taking that warning to heart and leaving the area. And we will be there to answer some questions. Where can we go? I have horses. I don't, I don't know if people have horses up here, but I have horses here, right? Who, who can I call to help me? Where can I take my horses? We'll be there to answer those questions. But as soon as that big red button is pulled and all of a sudden it becomes an order, that place is now going to be locked down, right? We are going to try our best to make sure that everybody is notified that we are now in an evacuation order, whether it's alert SCC, whether it's driving through the streets with a loudspeaker, maybe a helicopter, you know, screaming over their loudspeaker, hey, it's time to go, uh, social media sites. Um, that's how we're going to try to notify. It's very important to realize that the more people that are able to get those notifications, whether it's a warning or order, the easier it's going to be on us to try and contact everybody within those zones to tell them that it's time to leave. Because if they were notified and they prepared during a warning, maybe they took the action and they left. So that's less people, hopefully, that we will have to contact in an order zone to tell them it's time to go, right? So there are three things that can happen, right? When we think everybody's notified and we start going door to door, we're gonna do our best to go to every residence, right? The people will either have evacuated, they will have refused, but there's nobody coming. So what happens? People that want to evacuate, we're knocking on your door and telling you, hey, we're under an order, it's time to go. Thank you so much. We heard the warning, we prepared, right? And we get in our car and we leave, okay? The sheriff's office is probably going to post a notice, this is our CZU notice, on each and every door, right? Just basically saying that, hey, there's an order, We've been to this house. Then out on the street, and I've got an example over here, but everybody's seen police tape, right? Do not enter. At the sheriff's office, what we like to do is out near the street, because some people have longer driveways, whatever, we like to post some tape out there because it tells us that someone's already been there. Okay, so we don't have to double the efforts. That we don't have to go down that driveway two, three, four times to waste the time to try and contact people. So we post some tape at the end of it so that we know we've already been there. 
but this evacuation notice or something similar will be posted at everybody's door, right? Next step, people refuse. Well, they're still going to get a notice on their door. We're still going to tie some string up at the end, right, to tell everybody that we've already been there. But we're not going to make you go. We're not going to drag you out kicking and screaming. I will probably stand at your front door, pounding my feet on the ground and screaming, you could probably go, right? <laughs> this is dangerous. But I'm not going to drag you out. But I will let you know, hey, this is your choice. And just so you know, we may not be able to provide resources to come back and help you if you choose to stay. But so that you're aware, right? They may not, they may be too busy to come and do it, right? Again, I don't like fire, so I may not come and do it, right? But everything's going to be the same. It's just a matter of whether you choose to go or not. And then there's the last one, right? Last group, right? Those that aren't home. We will do everything the same. We will knock on that door. We will get no answer. We will post this notice. Why will we post this notice? To tell you, you need to go now, right? You weren't home. You need to go. So it's also notification, right? We went to your door, we knocked, nobody was home. How do we notify you? Well, we're going to leave you a notice, right? And then we're going to do the same thing. At the end of each contact, our deputies are going to actually take notes at each and every residence of what happened. I went to this residence. I talked to this many people. This many people are leaving. This many people are staying. Nobody was home. But that way we can account for every residence that we tried to make contact at, make contact at, right? We're going to try to tell you probably which direction to go because we don't want to drive towards fire. We want to make sure you know. Go to Los Gatos High School because that's where the evacuation point is. You know, drive to Cupertino, De Anza College, because that's where the evacuation point is. Drive to Santa Cruz. That's where we're, we're going to try our best to let you know where to go. Okay? Each deputy is going to have the most current and up-to-date action plan presented by fire, right? So we're going to know. And so we're a good resource to know where, you know, where to take your animals, where to take yourselves, where to take, you know, everything that you have. But just know that once you leave, until that order is lifted, it's closed. And that's how I started this, right? It's closed down. You can't come back. You're not going to be able to come back until it's deemed safe. And there will be our partners, our CHP partners, sheriff's office partners, making sure that nobody comes in. But what about my house, right? I left. There's nobody around. What about my house? Um... Right? My house is now available for anybody that wants to come in. Nobody's going to be around. We, we maintain security patrols in, in, in affected areas. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to limit looters, right? We find them, we take them to jail because it, you're, they're stealing your stuff. So rest assured, we will be in the area trying to make sure that no one's coming in to unoccupied residences and taking everybody's stuff. Because that's a big deal, right? Not only that, they're going to have to try and go past our road closures. Hopefully everybody, you know, we have people at road closure locations so people can't get through, but we can't, we can't, we don't have the resources to sit on every road. Sometimes it's a barriers, like it's down here at Old Santa Cruz, right? So we will try to get every road, but sometimes we don't, and that's why we have our security patrols inside, making sure that nobody comes and violates the sanctity of our residence and steals all of our stuff or anything like that. It's something that we weren't able to take with us when we left. Then when things are done, hopefully we can notify everybody, probably using the same means that our orders have been lifted, whatever it is, and we're free to go back, but that's down the line. So that's where we're safe. And so that's why we try to do those notifications the best we can. Sometimes it's hard to go house to house, and that's why we encourage people to get those notification systems um, so that they're aware and always try to keep up to date. Um, but that's that's kind of the sheriff's office role. Um, yeah, we'll hope somebody... The sheriff's deputy should be making patrols during mornings. They're probably not going house to house. Yeah. Um, but they're out and about, they're available for contact because, you know, it's a time when a lot of people have questions, you know, how long do I have, where is the fire, those are questions we probably won't be able to answer because again, I missed, I missed fire day in the academy, right, but I can tell you where to go, you know, I can tell you, you know, kind of maybe an update on what we know so far, um, you know, um, but there should be deputies out in the area. And it's actually good if you, during a warning, are going to leave and you come across a deputy to let them know, hey, just so you know, we have evacuated. Because they can note that. They can take that information down. And that's one less place that we have to try to get to in the future. So that's a good question. So once an area turns into an order, if you are outside of that order area, 
you won't be able to come back. But let, let's say I have animals, right? So <clears throat> there are mechanisms for people with animals, and I don't think I have it printed out here, but there are mechanisms with people with animals that can actually get an agriculture pass issued by the county, right? And it has to be signed, and it has to be notarized, and you have to actually do some preparation to do this. I can't recommend strongly enough that if you have large animals, right, and you think that there may be some kind of order, some kind of warning to, to plan ahead of time. However, if you cannot, I would take the steps ahead of time to make sure that, to, to try and obtain an act, it's called an act pass, right? To get an act pass issued by the county so that you can go and get your animals. There are certain restrictions for that, right? You can't do it at night. It, the, you, you can't stay overnight. You literally, during the day, can go and get your animals and you can come back out. But that has to, that's, there's a training program and you actually have to get that pass. Otherwise, if you don't have that pass and you have animals in there, you're, you're not going to be able to go in. Like yeah, what about small animals? Yeah, it's large animals, right? Yeah. Horses, horses. Talking about, like, dogs, yeah, dogs, it, that, yeah, dogs and cats won't be included in the NAG pass. We're talking about like, and again, we're not talking about up here, but those, a good, a good way to put it would be for ranchers, right? Ranchers have cattle and horses and things like that. If you have dogs and cats, there, there's not going to be a mechanism to come back into an ordered area, evacuation order area, to come back and get go bags or animals. What I'm saying is that you should be paying attention to what the weather is, right. what the weather is about, and that if you know we're not going to drive by a dog. I mean, I, I, I right. know for a fact I've rescued multiple dogs on fires that right. I've been at. If they're running around, I'm going to grab them and put them in my truck. Right. But you're not going to be, that's why we're hammering the fact that if you guys have a go bags, put one in your car because you're right. If we tell you there's a fire in Soda Springs and Chimiquita Park is imminently threatened, we're not letting you back in there. Yeah, yeah. Have your go bag with you already. But as for your animals, I know it's not probably what you want to hear, but we're not going to let you back in and get your dogs. I'm sorry. Let us know where they are. We'll do our best to get them out of the way or find them. But for large animals, unfortunately, this was from the SCU Lightning Complex where hundreds of cattle were killed because the ranchers couldn't get in there and get those, those, those animals out. Same with the horses. That, that, that was the, 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 the stopgap for that problem, but it does not apply to animals or cat, or, I'm sorry, dogs or cats. Anymore. That's where we get to the main theme of preparation, right? You know, being prepared not only ahead of time, but when an incident is close enough you know, to affect us, being prepared. Two, two forms of being prepared, right? Being prepared, like, oh my gosh, this could happen, so. Okay. You guys are so set up so much better than a lot of the communities that I engage with. I mean, you guys and all the Carl Tights are like the gold standard for preparation. I mean, I, I, people right here, there are more people here at this community meeting, and I've had nothing but community meetings with Chelsea for the last month and a half. I would say of the last five meetings, there are more people here than I've seen in five meetings. Wow. So, no, that's, that's <laughs> So it sounds like you guys have mechanisms in place to take care of each other, and that is that is huge, especially out here in a rural area where you're away from services, and you're isolated, and, and getting more so weekly. You guys seem to you guys have a mechanism in place. I can't guarantee it's going to go perfectly if something catastrophic were to happen, but you know that the, all of us that are here have a vested interest in making sure that we do the best that we can. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, but you know, as part of you know the the instant command, you know, there's more than just the fire you know, partners and the law enforcement partners. There's, you know, PG needs and water companies and animal services, you know, you know, that are that are there specifically to try and help in their field. So well a couple of things. I mean we're talking about, you know, roads and so, you know, county roads and airports unfortunately, you know, not being here, um, but that's you know kind of in their purview, right? And, it's a as, road. Well, okay, and as much as much pull as I'd like to think I have, I, I just don't have a whole lot, right? I mean, I stay in my lane, right? But then the other thing is, is we're talking about, you know, a, a, a difficult time right now to try and, and prioritize one roadway over another. And so, a year ago, the conversation may have been different, but, you know, due to what's happening in the last two or three months, you know, that's a difficult conversation to have because, you know, I, I can't go you know, to the county board or to any, any of, you know, the, the people in the county and say, hey, we, this road's pretty terrible, we should prioritize this road, when right now what they're looking at is every road, because every road right now is impacted. Um, I just don't have that kind of, as much as I wish I did, I just don't have that kind of uh, juice. I know that my office is engaged at the highest level with county roads, and we're, we're talking about multiple things. We're talking about the trees that were clearing the roadways and we're leaving all the jackpots along the roadway and the plan to clean that up. 
We're talking about prioritizing slides and roads, Bear Creek Road, Old Santa Cruz Highway, Old Croft Heights. Some of these roads, like I said, they are major, major problems. Right. Old Croft is still moving. At, at least Old Santa Cruz is getting attention. My point is, that's not going to go away anytime quickly. We're pointing that out. That road counts, though. It is, I mean, you, you guys know anything about it? You've been on it recently? I, I, I'm the Holy City Way, I take it every time I can't get home and traffic is jacked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a private road, sir, and that's the yeah. thing. We're a county entity. We can't yeah. give county funds to private okay. properties. It's a gift of public funds. And yes, we can engage with that. Do they have a road association? I'd be happy to talk to them about it. my concerns. Okay. Yeah, that's how it works. It's the county sheriff's on the county roads, the state CHP on the okay. highways. But I'm telling I'm you right now, sure can any of you remember that six acre okay. fire we had seven years ago? And we had a jackknife dig rig up on Highway 35 that jacked every single access road in this mountain. Yeah. And so I, these, these roads were never meant for all of us to be on them at the same time. And 17 is going to be gridlocked. That's why I, I mean, I take focused on. You know, we, I mean, shoot, I'm, I, I, I'm in your shoes when it comes, you know, to these and, and you know, my house and my family and, it, and we get focused on, well, it's it's just a warning right now. I don't have to leave yet. I'll wait till it turns to an order. But the problem with that is, is so many other people are thinking the same thing. And so I, now seeing it from this level, know that, well, shoot, if, if, they're talking about my zone, and it may be an advisory or it may be a warning. I'm probably going to act quicker rather than later because we've all seen the news coverage of impassable roads because there's so many cars. Like, look at what happened in Tahoe this past year, right? You couldn't go anywhere. And so I know I'm going to be prepared to leave sooner rather than later because, you know, I mean, my life is more important than my stuff. Um, some of my stuff is very dear and personal to me, but my life is more important than my stuff. It just is. And so I'm probably going to leave sooner rather than later because now that I've seen these news coverage and these news footage of roads that just, you know, takes hours to go one mile, and I, I don't want to be in that. So, so just to touch on your question, um, when, when we get an incident, we talk about the incident command and going unified command. So what that is is we're all sitting here, all the main leaders that have anything to do with fish and wildlife, public roads, we're all making decisions together. And when, when we make these decisions, and that goes for, we distribute it out to the field. So if there's an officer uh, for the CHP, we have a representative from CHP here, and he can relay back up to, hey, there's residents here. Okay, yeah, yeah, are we good with that? Are we good with that? Let them out. Okay, yeah, let them out. And so we communicate up and down um, the whole time. Now, now with that down, it's like a suicide mission yeah. to go to the grocery yeah. store. Yeah, yeah. So totally. And it's, um, yeah. It, we're communicating constantly. It's a constant communication of uh, field resources and, and us making the decisions on what, what's going on with evacuation orders and warnings. Um, yeah. Does that it's good question? that you guys are here, that we're, and that's why we're practicing this evacuation drill on a small scale for your community. You know, we picked 20, 20, 20 is what we can handle right now, just, just to see, to, pra to practice what you guys already have in place. I think with those 20 vehicles, you're going to see the importance of what we're hammering into your head. Of. Even with no fire and only 20 people or 20 vehicles evacuating out of here, it's going to take some time. Yeah, with the road systems especially now. And that's like Chief Hackett was saying, having have an alternate, alternate route, right? So now that bridge is taken out. So now where are we going to go? Oh, well now we have our secondary right here, this way. Um, it's, it's definitely tough. Question, when we see the helicopters going around, what is the position? What, what are they doing? Can you explain that a little bit? So, fun. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, for you guys, uh, if you see the helicopter flying around right now, they're training. They're getting ready. They're preparing for summertime. They're preparing for uh, hoist operations. Um, we have a new helicopter. It's, it's the Black Hawk. We're calling it the Fire Hawk. Um, so they're doing a ton of training on it to be proficient in, with it. Um, the pilots, the crew, um, we're getting the firefighters back next month, so they're going to be flying quite a bit. Um, so unless you get the alerts, they're just training. Okay, so in the actual fire, they do... They, they drop water, they land, and they drop their crew off. The crew will go fight the fire and go with the, with the helicopter and fight the fire. So they're, and they're making the bucket drops or tank drops. Right? What's that? I said they're taking the water from Lexington to... 
Yeah, wherever they can get water from the closest resource, they'll grab it. And if they can fit in that that LZ or that area, they'll get it from there. Okay. I haven't been following, but like you announced, we're doing training things just so we don't like think something's wrong. <laughs> we don't. No, nope, we don't. Know, you're just being nice just to let the community know that you're like training so that we're not like, oh, what's coming now? Yeah. <laughs> two trips coming up where we're going to have a house sitter, mm -hmm. those people need to know this information. If they're staying at your house and taking care of their animals or plants, they need to know this information because nature happens when it happens. So just that we extend this on, if you're bringing someone in, that's another thing to take care of. Okay, um, so we're going to wrap this up for right now. Okay. If you go to the website, I'm going to keep It'll say under the My Neighborhood in Evacuation, there's a map that our mail carrier Leah handcrafted. So it's not exactly perfectly um, where, where the house is, but it's yeah, to scale. But it's pretty close. And it shows you which exit you're supposed to use. So down in the bottom part, you're going to see that you're going to go up out Upper Ovalala. The part over here, you're going to go out on Lower Ovalala. And if there is a fire in the park, we do not use Edwards because that is the entrance for all of our first responders. So the Edwards people, the green here, you would go either to the north or upper or lower Ovalala. If there is a major wildfire and we just got a zone, a warning zone or, or a uh, evacuation zone, um, you can use all of the, and it's outside of Chamaquita Park, it's you know, like a couple miles away, but we get told that we have to leave, then you can use the Edwards exit as a third exit. So you don't use the Edwards whenever there's a fire within the Correct. Fire. Correct. So go to, I, I made copies of them here, and you can take them here, but these two pieces are on the website, and um, you can utilize those. Right. All right, um, so the end result of all of this is you have to pay attention to what's going on in the weather, particularly in the summer, right? If you wake up in the morning, it's nice and cool, and you walk across your lawn or your weeds or whatever you got, and they don't crinkle, that's not that big of a deal, right? But if you wake up, or later in the afternoon, you've got a wind shift in the afternoon, it's getting really hot, you need to start paying attention to, is this fire weather today? Is this a day that if the fire is going to start, it's going to be bad or it's going to move slow, right? You should make those decisions on your own. Be prepared to think along those lines early on, right? If you feel uncomfortable, leave. You don't have to wait for fire or law to come knocking on your door and say, hey, it's time to go. You should be paying attention to that already. If you're on pulse point and you hear the sirens, Dana and I geek on scanner geek all the time on that. What are they doing? Where are they going? The days when I was a battalion chief and I brought my vehicle home, something was going on, I'd listen to Mike running a call. Okay, to know what I to know what was going on. All right, so there are tools out there that you all can use to stay ahead of all of this stuff. Do all the website searching, all the training you can do that way, so you're prepared. At least you're running through this, you're running this through your head already. Don't get caught short. That's the main thing. We live in an environment that's very dynamic, and we've certainly experienced that this winter. Right? This has been nasty. I've been living in the Santa Cruz Mountains on and off since 1982. I have never experienced a winter like this, ever. Okay, and so some of the other long-term people up here are gonna say the same thing. This has been an unusual year. You have to pay attention. You can't sit like you're living in a cute little house in the middle of a block in San Jose down in the valley, right? It's different up here. You have to pay attention. You have to rely on your neighbors. You have to know who your neighbors are. You don't have to like them, but you have to know. You have to know that you have to count on each other when the shit hits a fan. That's just straight up, right? So, 
If you think it's time to go, go. Don't wait for somebody to knock on the door. All right? These people, what I used to do, what these people do today, standing in the back, wherever you are, they risk their lives to keep us from doing stupid stuff. Okay? And they try to present us with the opportunity to educate ourselves so we make smart, wise decisions and we don't get caught short and die. Thank you. <laughs>